Hey everyone, welcome to the Worship Artistry Podcast brought to you by worshipartistry.com. My name is Jason Houtsma and I have a very froggy voice today, so please bear with me. And uh, over in the chat room, as always, is Bethany, just kind of hanging out. We got a lot of people here today. So uh, sh- if you have questions, just type them in there. You don't have to add the little question or the little dash Q. Bethany will compile them and then we'll answer them at the end. And with me today is Mr. Dan Egan. What's up, Dan? Hey, bud. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Dan is, um, he's, he's actually been working on something for Worship Artistry and uh, for, for a long time, and we're about to release him. He's our new Hammer Dulcimer teacher. So Dan, why don't you kind of talk to us a little bit about the Hammer Dulcimer lessons that you're doing? Yeah. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. It's, it's been a passion of mine since I was about three and a half weeks old. <laughs> do you do you know do you know what a hammer dulcimer is? Uh, well, yeah, I was born with with the stick in my hand. No, I don't really know what a hammer dulcimer is. I know I know Rich Mullins used one, and he used them in a lot of stuff, especially on a what was it a, a legacy a, a liturgy a legacy in a ragamuffin band, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. Anything Rich did, I was my my father was playing that stuff in the house early on. I was pretty young, and I. Loved it. That guy, he was a pioneer. Yeah. Well, he was a he was he was actually the first kind of quote unquote celebrity death that ever actually had an impact on me. I remember when he when he passed away and yeah, and it was like it was a rough day. You know, I yeah. definitely kind I of remember spent that some time. too. That was brutal. His story is fascinating. I, but he really did pave the way for a lot of worship worship leaders. Well, Dan. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about, we're actually going to be responding to an article that's been kind of making the rounds on Facebook, which uh, the title of the article is, It's Time to Boycott the Worship Industry. And uh, we've we've already been getting, you know, when you get blogs like this and uh, and articles like this, it's it's very tempting to kind of jump into these things and, and the comment sections just get crazy. And I don't like to jump into those sorts of things. I would much rather just have a rational discussion about it. And so as we're sort of in the worship industry, I guess you could say we are, um, I thought it would be a great topic for us to kind of discuss really openly and honestly. And uh, and Dan, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Dan, why don't you tell tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. Yeah, my name's Dan Egan, and uh, I am one of the founders of worshipartistry.com. I'm one of the owners with with my buddy Jason. What's really cool is Jason and I were college roommates and we also grew up together. And so here we are working together. And we married sisters. We, oh, thank don't you, forget buddy. that. Yeah, we, we married into the same family. So we're brothers <laughs> in laws. We really did that so that we could be closer together. It didn't really have anything to do with the pretty Norwegian girls. No, no, not at all. <laughs> but yeah, so besides that, uh, I also play bass guitar for uh, a worship band out of Colorado Springs called the Desperation Band and yeah. been doing that for a little bit over 10 years been able to share the stage uh, with them and other artists like Paul Balash, United, Carrie Job um a who's didn't who tour with will. those guys. <laughs> yeah, a who's who. Yeah, I'm I hold on, I dropped something, a bunch of names. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but worship is is a passion as it is yours, and teaching worship is has just been a blast. So yeah, thanks thanks for the uh, thanks for the intro. But it's good to be here with all of you guys. All right. Well, before we jump into that conversation, let's go ahead and do some member mail. Dan, you got a question for us here? I do. Yes, uh, we have a pretty f- cool question from uh, Benny Leander. From the from the UK across the pond, my friend. Nice. And he wants to know what is the most unusual item or piece of equipment in your studio, the worship artistry in our studio. <laughs> wow, that's, that's that's actually an interesting question. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff in my studio. Uh, worship artists, we have a number of different studios. We've got one in Bellingham, Washington, which is where I am, where everything started. And then we have one in Nashville, and we have two different ones in Florida, just for each of our teachers. And they all have the nice studios, because my studio is kind of the flagship, not sure if we're actually going to make it studio. <laughs> so, you know, and I was sitting in the dark, so I don't even have walls on my studio. I actually have like moving blankets 
and there's no sheetrock or anything. The floor, the the carpet isn't even tacked to the floor, and we could like fix it up now, but it's kind of like, yeah, it works. Well, you know, don't don't mess with a good thing. It works. Um, so there's a lot of weird stuff in there. I'd have to say, probably the the strangest thing is when we first started uh, Worship Artistry. When I first started doing videos, I needed something to look at to look at the camera, and so I needed to. I was like, I need to pin like a something right underneath because you have to look right under the camera to make it feel like you're looking at the camera. And so I just looked around this this office I had just moved into, and I found a a twelve pack like a a beer twelve pack case of a beer called Hopsar. So I, I was like, well, well, let me see here. So I cut out, there's a little guy on the front. He looks like a king and he's holding a scepter with a hop on it. It's very odd looking. It's kind of creepy. But anyway, he- Sounds like it. I cut him out and I, I stuck him to underneath. So I just, I basically have this little king that I teach to and he's like my Wilson. You know, it's like when I'm sitting <laughs> in my in my studio alone, I'm kind of like, I'm like, shut up, Will, shut up, Hopsar, I'll get it. Just wait, it's coming. So that's probably the this. this strangest the strangest thing in our, in my in my studio. It's not really a piece of equipment, it's just a piece of cardboard, but he's been there for like four years now. So Well, when you're in that cave of a studio, and, and he's <laughs> right, guys, it's it was built in the beginning we didn't know if this whole worship archery thing was gonna fly, but obviously we know now, but uh, it's that, flying that hasn't now, really man. changed or improved, has it? Well, everybody else has, like Josh has like really nice soundboard and it's all bright and pretty. And Daniel's got like a fridge for the artists that come in and he's got drinks and stuff like that. And then there's me and my little blanket fort. So that's that's our worship artistry studio. If you'd like to be featured on member mail, you can uh, either tweet us at worship artistry or you can also leave a comment on member mail in the green room. You just go to worshipartistry.com slash green room type member mail in the search bar and just leave us a comment and you will try to answer here. It can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about equipment or about blanket forts. It can really be about really anything. So feel free to ask questions over there. Um, we're going to take a quick break here and then we're going to dive into the question of, is it time to boycott the worship industry? Hey, Jason. Hey, Dan. How you feeling, bud? Not so great. I've been losing my voice for the last week. Yeah, you sound terrible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I do. But unfortunately, I don't have anybody to back me up this Sunday, so I still have to lead worship. I wish there was some easy way to train leaders behind me so they could learn the songs and be prepared so I'm not stuck on the spot trying to sing without a voice. There is, buddy. Have you heard of WorshipArtistry.com? Worship Artistry? What's that? Oh, it's the cat's pajamas. <laughs> Worship Artistry is an online resource featuring full five-piece band arrangements of all the latest and top worship songs. Each song is broken down by section and features in-depth teaching videos, practice loops, charts, tabs, and sheet music for lead and rhythm guitar, keyboard, bass, and even drums. Wow, that does sound incredible for my beginners. Is there any way my experienced players can grow from it? That's what's so awesome about it. Even though every lesson features a ton of content, it's easily chaptered, so you can jump right to the part that you need to learn. Wait, so you're saying I don't have to watch a 10-minute YouTube video to get the 30 seconds of the information I actually need? That's right. And once you've got it, you can practice along with the music <laughs> video and loops to gain confidence and refine your playing. Wow, that does sound like the cat's pajamas. Meow. How do I sign up? Just go to worshipartistry.com and sign up for your risk-free trial. They have plans to cover both individual members and teams. Well, I'm going to pause this podcast and head over there right now and then return and listen to the amazing discussion we're about to have. Okay, we are back. Today, we have something really interesting to talk about. A very controversial topic, wouldn't you say, Jay? Yes, we're... We're all about the controversy here at Worship Artistry. Just clickbait, <laughs> clickbait, clickbait. Yes. Well, this, this, the title is It's Time to Boycott the Worship Industry. It was written by a blogger. I'm not sure who it is. His name is Jonathan Algner. Algner, yeah, on the Pathios um, blog. So, yeah, let's dive in. This is a hot topic. The, there's definitely people on both sides of this that... Uh, that are passionately on one side or the other. So the way I see it, there's two camps 
and uh, Camp One is the the camp that agrees with him, basically saying worship has uh, gotten too worldly, too showy, too not sacred enough, too industry, too business, uh, too emotional. It's lost theological depth, caters to entertainment value. Um, and then he talks about the worship celebrity phenomenon as unhealthy, damaging, all about money and, and emulating secular uh, pop culture. So that's that's kind of one camp. He's coming in with a loaded gun. He's, he's firing in a lot of directions. Yeah, so that's camp one. Camp two... The people that disagree, okay? So they're saying, hey, worship has actually caught up to the to the world uh, as far as quality and has bridged a, a gap that once was between Christian music and non-Christian music. Uh, and that gives opportunity to share Christ easier and, and relate to non-believers. And uh, having these, what he calls uh, worship leader celebrities, they're saying... This camp is saying it's it's great. Uh, they carry influence. They're extremely talented. They should be paid for their work, and um, we're we're really in the best time we've ever been as far as worship and connecting with with God. So that's the that's where the two camps are. Before we dive into the sections of this blog article, uh, Jay, I want to know from you what camp what camp are you in? <laughs> are you a mix of both? I you know I think he he actually has a couple good points. I'm I'm not uh, I I I'm I, as as always in life I always kind of find myself in the middle. I'm kind of like well, there's some good thoughts about this and there's some good thoughts about that. Um, very political of you. Yes. Well, I th- actually I'm not very political because you know I think what everybody's looking for nowadays are those sound bites where somebody just fires off something inflammatory and then somebody else fires off something opposite inflammatory and you end up in this argument. And I just don't think there's any place for that in the church, period. I think that's a really crappy part of our culture. And when the church engages in that, it's just engaging in this very non-Christ-like way of engaging. I mean, Jesus obviously had very strong opinions about things. He was God. You know, he was probably upset about a few things. That were going on. Um, Maybe. But, yeah. But he is God, not past tense. Present still. Um, so so I kind of I kind of look at both those things. I see some of the things that there's there's a thing about. There's reacting to some things that this, uh, this writer doesn't like. And there's things that I don't like about the worship industry also. Um, but then it's kind of like, okay, how do you approach that? You know, calling for a boycott... Uh, and and going in this extreme, I don't think is is quite the way to go about it. Um, I'm generally much more of the place of go run somewhere, do something beautiful, and hope people follow you rather than sit on the sidelines and throw rocks at the people that are actually trying to run the race. So that's that's where I I don't know if that that really does that answer your question. It's kind of between. Yeah, it does. Both, it does. I you know. obviously he's a blogger. He's a he's a or journalist or whatever you want to call him. So he's gonna we'll call it a blogger. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna put together headlines that get clicks. And and I've never heard of this blog. And here we are talking about it. So he did he did something right maybe. But let's <laughs> let's talk about the sections of this of this post. And and we'll, and we can post uh, the the link to this in the show notes. But uh, section one, it, he talks about money shouldn't drive what churches sing, uh, mm-hmm. meaning we should stop singing the songs that only marketable rock star type people are writing. Yeah. What 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 do you what do you say to that, Big Daddy? Well, you know, I think the headline uh, "Money Shouldn't Drive What Churches Sing" is uh, is absolutely true. Um, you know, there is an industry around, uh, you know, especially modern worship. I mean, this guy does kind of have a, a legitimate beef in some things of kind of the showy rock star kind of thing. Um, congregational worship to me is something that's very just inherently different. It serves a different purpose than uh, your your stuff, your your average rock music or pop music or whatever. It's, it's meant to serve a body and it's a totally different it's not a genre it's just a totally different thing so even trying to compare the two is kind of ridiculous to me um but that being said the way that we receive music now is you know we receive it through these through these channels we receive it through radio we receive it through people telling us about it um 
that's how we hear music. You know, so essentially what the worship industry has done is they've gone, hey, we're writing these songs. We want people to know about them. The only way that we know to help people know about them and to teach it to them is to put them on the radio, create resources so that people can learn them and make them pleasing to the ear so that it's something that's um, worthwhile. The The idea that that money is driving is kind of interesting because ultimately churches, nobody, you can, you can kind of push music down. You know, you, there were kind of, there's people that are marketing music to the church, but ultimately the church decide at large decides what they're going to grab onto and what they're going to connect with. I think, um, you know, the song oceans by Hillsong United, right? Like that song was huge. And I don't think anybody would have pegged this moody, synthy, slow builder, you know, nine minute song or however long it was. I don't think anybody would have pegged. That's the single. That's the one that everybody's going to grab onto. But sure enough, I, I, it, that's, that's what the church went. This is meaningful to me. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have an industry that's firing off these different things. And yes, they're trying to make money because they're trying to sustain themselves. But ultimately the church is what's, who's making the decision on what songs fly. And they're making it based on what's coming to them. And then they go, okay, this is the one that, this one resonates with me. And then you see that happening on a global scale with some songs. Sure, sure. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. This article, it makes me think, is this the same same opinion that pastors should not be paid well? Uh, They should drive, they shouldn't be driving nice cars. You know, there's always that that argument, you know, if you're in ministry, then you're in ministry and you're kind of roughing it and shouldn't, shouldn't really be paid for like an executive for your work. And I've never been in that camp, but, um, the, the funny thing, the reason why this is a tough conversation, uh, tough to really know is because music is emotional. Okay. Mm -hmm. God created music to be that way. And so when, when he's saying, when he's using emotions as a, as a bad word, as a negative word, it's really difficult. I mean, I don't know if this guy's a musician. Uh, my guess is he's not, but maybe he is. Um, my guess is he's a theolo- theological thinker, which is awesome, which is great. We need that. But um, it, it, yeah, I agree with you that it, it's not a one camp or the other. It's definitely where you're at and personally. But let's go to the, se- the second section yeah. so we move along. But he says a reason to boycott worship is to because it creates... Uh, its own idols, and he has a picture of of a girl singer and and Chris Tomlin. The girl, as far as I know, is not a worship leader. Uh, it's funny. He says he says because you know these two people, and I'm like I don't know who she is. <laughs> I, I, there was a Facebook comment saying this girl is from this band, who's not a worship band or a Christian band or anything. So I don't know what he was. I think he was just trying to prove a point by lying. No, I'm well, just kidding, but you but don't know. You don't know. Maybe she is somebody. No, no, definitely not. Out. So Tomlin is obviously there, and he even coined a new term in the article: Tomlinization. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Yeah. So anyway, let's let's speak <clears throat> to that. Uh, does it does it create idols? These worship leaders, uh, kind of how we how we look at you know Bono and those guys. You know, it's interesting because it, I think once again it goes back to the medium. You know. Um, I don't know anybody who has a Chris Tomlin poster on their wall with like hearts around it. Um, I don't. Uh, Clearly, you've not been <clears throat> at my house lately. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, I feel like a lot of what is placed on worship leaders is placed on them, not what they put on themselves. So generally, my experience has been when I hang out with with professional worship leaders, you know, and get to interview Jason Ingram and Jeremy Camp and, you know, a number of these guys, like they're all guys that are just trying to write songs for the church. They have like this heart of gold kind of a thing. And once again, the medium, what helps people hear it and makes people want to listen to it is all the stuff that they do around it. Because one, and I, once again, I think that speaks more to, especially our American and it's probably not just American, but our American kind of consumeristic culture of, yes, I want to, I want this music, but I want it to be in this realm. And he speaks specifically, he says, you know, uh, 
the worship leaders develop these huge followings with devoted fans, t-shirts, recording contracts, you know, the whole deal. And like the headliners of the blockbuster movie, they're the draw. They're getting paid the big bucks. They're selling tickets. And the problem with this is that churches are modeling their gatherings or com on commercial entertainment, bringing rock conks or ambience into sanctuaries and transforming congregants from worshipers into Chris Tomlin groupies. That's a really strong statement. And that's a really interesting thing to blame Chris Tomlin for. I think if there's a, I think if there's a, if there is an issue, it's less about, it's less about what, what Chris Tomlin's doing. And it's more about how people are responding. And if it's a, whether it's a copycat culture or whether it's, um, uh, whether it's, it's just how the overall approach to church, I think pointing and blaming and saying, okay, churches, you know, you guys are wrong for doing this. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm super uncomfortable in those kind of church environments. I'm just, I'm just not a, I'm not a fan. I totally see the purpose of it. And I think that in, if it fits the culture and it's, and it fits the vision of the church by all means, like that's, that's what you should do because that's drawing people, right? It's not what I'm most comfortable in. It's not necessarily what I want to do, but to sit there and go, well, and that's what the, everything that's wrong with the worship industry or whatever I think is, is kind of off. So I think sure I'm kind of meandering here a little bit, but I, I think that, that blaming the worship writer and the worship leader who's just trying to do something that they are doing, trying to do to the best of their ability. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. I, here's, <laughs> here's the difference between well, a lot of things, me and you, Jay, you're up in Bellingham, Washington. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's a, it's a Northwest of the country. Um, there's a culture up there, obviously. Yes. I'm here in Colorado, Colorado Springs. Um, my twin brother it's a, it's is a different Johnny culture. Again. Yeah, he's the we we go to a mega church uh, by definition, just with how many people go. He's the singer songwriter for the for the Desperation Band, but he's also the worship leader at the church. He's written Overcome, I Am Free, some some big songs that have been out there commercialized by him and other artists, of course, right? So, but. What, what are we kingdom minded or are we just trying to make existing Christians better Christians, right? So when you when you think about nope, nope, <laughs> when you think about pop culture and the music, it's there's some good stuff out there as a musician, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I love One Republic, um, I love Coldplay and Adele's just came out with a ridiculous record. Yes, we do listen to secular music here. Yeah. Dan, you 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 did it wrong. You're supposed to drop two names that nobody's ever heard of. Yes. And then like one so that you can get a little more hipster cred. Okay. Uh, like I'm Buffalo really... Tom is <laughs> just a huge influence in my life. Thanks to the my so-called life soundtrack. Remember that guy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, but Mumford, I mean, the music industry is really, I think, coming back uh, for so while. It's just kind of these uh, Beyonce's, and, and which are incredible talents, but um, the band, the musical bands are coming back in a big way, which I love. So um, why not, not, not copy, but if we're already listening to it and loving it and the hooks and the music, it's emotional, um, why is it wrong? To, to write Christian music in that way, to be kingdom-minded and to appeal to that and to, and to not let the secular music just destroy Christian music in every way. Um, so I'm asking a rhetorical, why is that wrong? Or is it wrong? Well, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong. Um, but there, there's also the, the, the side of it that goes, you know, uh, and he kind of makes this point throughout, but he talks about how, uh, you know, basically everybody's just copying these big artists and, you know, the church should be writing songs for themselves, not just these, you know, 10 people or whatever. And, um, and I, you know, it's an interesting point. I mean, ultimately I would love it if, um, if, if every church was able to afford, because you would have to pay this person to have like an artist in residence, somebody who wrote songs for the church. I write songs for my church. We just, um, you know, released the Common Song Project. I just shared that with the worship artistry community. It's a short film we did. And it was just a way for my own people in my own community to get some of the songs that I was writing 
that they were asking for that I literally had no way to give them. It was like, hey, I love that song. I want to use it in my quiet times. You know, where do I, how can I get it? It's like, you can't. You just hear it on Sunday when we do it. That's all I got for it, you know? Um, and we weren't able to, uh, we, we couldn't afford to take a record, to make a record, because it, it's expensive to make a record in a way that people can hear it. Because if I just hand you a demo recording of me singing into my iPhone, it's not going to connect with you in the way that a really well-recorded song would. Problem is, recording songs really well is time-consuming and expensive. So once you do that, then you have to go and market that and sell it. Like it's just kind of the nature of this beast that we've created. And uh, and so what we did is we just made this short film, we got a bunch of people to donate their time, we shot four songs, and it was just really just a way to go, okay, here's here's the music. It's yours now. You can you can do whatever you want with it. And um so but even that took like a ton of time. And I've spent fifteen plus years of my life writing worship music. And I would say that probably the last five is like the best that I've written and is, has most connected with my church. And so some of those songs probably aren't meant for the church, huge, you know, universal, but they're meant for my community because they're driven by the people in my community. It's, you know, I wrote this song because just found out that Lynn had cancer and I'm praying and I'm asking God, what can Lynn even sing right now? You know, so write a song specifically for, for that space. Um, and so it's, that's awesome when you can do that. But guys, super time consuming. And, you know, it takes a lot of work and, um, and effort and a skill to do that. So the idea that it's like, well, let's just have everybody in our churches just writing songs. Guys, people all the time are like, hey, check out the song I wrote. And it's like, wow, that's awesome for you in your quiet time by yourself with God. <laughs> like you can't ask somebody to sing that song either. Either it's not melodic enough or, you know, the lyrics are all over the place and they're not like, there's still this craft of songwriting. So to me, it's there. The only way for this to feasibly happen is to have people who are good at their craft that are spending the time on it. And you know what they're worth. They are worth what they get paid because they, because they're they're investing their time. Every once in a while, I get people that are like, why don't you do worship artistry 100% for free? It's like, because it takes me 50 hours a week to populate this website, and I can't feed my family if I do that for free. I did it for free for a number of years, just getting it going, and it's not sustainable. You can't make good, you can't make good content. And so- But can, idea, you, can you keep a pure heart and still write music that people pay for. Uh, obviously, I, I have my opinion on that. But what do you say? I think as far as, you know, I've wrestled a lot. We're actually going to do a whole podcast just on uh, making money in worship. I got to find a better name for it because I don't know if that quite captures it. But that works. You know, when the um, I've gone, I've done the gamut. I've been on staff. I quit because I didn't want to be paid for what I was doing. Uh, I'm now paid part time. You know, there's there comes a point in time where like you only have so much space in your life, and if you're going to be responsible, and you have to and you have to be there if you're going to be the person that like if everything else falls apart, I'm the one that's still there and I keep it going. Then to me, there's value in having to do that. That's more than what a volunteer is doing. You know, mm -hmm. um, likewise with with writing. You know, I write, I write volunteer. You know, I write specifically for my church community because I love to do it. I'll always do it. And when I can make it available to other people, I will. But, you know, I'm not writing for that. You know, I'm not writing for that purpose. If God sees, sees fit to use that in some way, amazing. That would be the most mind-blowing thing in the world for me. I would go crazy. I'd love it. But at the same time, it's like I'm being, my job, my job is worship artistry. It's what I, but I have to be paid for that because I need to spend the time on it. I think that you can, I'll, I'll tell you that my heart is very much about teaching and equipping and loving on people and not about just making a buck. Trust me, if it was just about making a buck, I would have quit this a long time ago because it's been quite a building process, <laughs> as you well know, Dan. I well um, know, buddy. <laughs> a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of years in the dark. 
Uh, I try not to think about it. Yeah, don't think about it. Yeah. Don't go to the dark place. <laughs> Start sucking my thumb. But um, but I do think that there is a place. I, I think a lot of these worship musicians are in a place of, of having a, a pure heart and wanting to serve the church. Um, there's actually a great article by Jacob Suter, who's the keyboardist for um, for Vertical Church that we had on the green room. And he was talking about writing the song Spirit of the Living God with Mia Fields. You know, guys, these guys all get together in a room, these songwriters, and they write together. And people see that as a, as a, um, as, as, as a, what's the word I'm looking for? As something bad, like, well, they got in a room and tried to create this product. But they're not getting in a room going, all right, what's popular today, guys? All right, let's try and take those that chord progression and we're going to mash it up with this and then we're going to take these lyrics that we know are popular that churches have bought before. That's not what they do. They get together. I've been in these rooms. You get together, you pray, you ask God, what do you want to speak to the church now? You spend time in worship and then you see what bubbles to the surface. Yeah. And however that ends up reaching, if our if our culture is gra- has to grab it because they can't sit there and listen to that little recording that happens in the room and need to have a full band recording to understand to really have that song communicated with them to them i think yeah i think i think it's i think it's absolutely appropriate if you don't think god can meet somebody seeking them (laughs) trying to write a song for the church and if he can't gift them with that i don't i maybe god's too limited i don't know (laughs) maybe it can only happen if it happens in your local church i don't know well there's no there's no question you the music industry has progressed. The hymns of of, of years ago are incredible, very theologically yes. sound and deep. So, um, some of them. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how deep into the hymn book you've gone. Some of them get a little dicey. I read it every night. Oh, okay. His eyes are on the sparrow, Jay. <laughs> not that they are. <laughs> but I, but to echo what you just said, I also been in these rooms. I know a lot of these artists. Jason Ingram is a name that a lot of people don't know, but they all know his songs. Yeah, they do. Because Tomlin, Crowder, Redman, Desperation Band, I can name 30 bands that he's written for that are huge hits. Um, he has his own band, One Sonic Society. Go check those guys They're out. They're awesome. Incredible. Jason's the lead singer and songwriter. Stu G from Delirious is the guitar player. And Paul Mayberry, who's done a ton of engineering record, or uh, he's produce a lot of records used to play for united if you're a drummer you know who who paul mayberry is yeah he's on our green room he's done some cool stuff with us but i know these guys and jeremy camp's a good friend of mine they they love love the lord they love god they and they want their songs to be theologically sound and to bring place to a place where they're bring people to a place where they're they're meeting with jesus and so it's hard to when i read I get a little emotional when I hear "Let's boycott worship," um, because because I know where these. And by songs emotional, are I mean I throw my computer out the window. Yeah, <laughs> but the song overcome. Okay, but John wrote it. Jeremy Camp uh, made it huge. But that, that, I know where that song came from. It came from yeah. fear and anxiety that he was dealing with. Okay, and and it's amazing the stories and the testimonies we've heard from that from that song, and my brother who wrote it. Yeah, he wears skinny jeans. <laughs> Sometimes he's very skinny, though. He can he can pull it off. He's got <laughs> you know funny hair and he looks the part. But I, the the man behind behind the hair behind the hair <laughs> product is 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 phenomenal and it's just is like the rest of us. We're trying to figure it out day by day, but just loves the Lord, trusts the Lord. And so that's that's why this article kind of rubbed me, and I'm trying not to be too opinionated here, yeah. um, because he does have some good points. Uh, we don't want to idolize any person. Same with pastors, book authors, worship leaders. Yeah. Um, but let's, if you don't mind, let's go to the next section of the blog article. Sure. Yeah. It talks about the how a congregation's voice should be primary, and not the. Not the the actual leader, the the person writing the song. What do you think? Uh, I totally agree with that. Actually, um, at the same time, I totally disagree with where he goes with it. Um, to me, like it was, you know, damn, you know, we were talking about the Common Song Project this last week, um, and 
such a there was such a pivotal moment for me when I first like I because I had come from the the modern worship like the, the stage the music's so loud and I liked that I had I had enjoyed that the music's so loud that you feel like you can belt it out because nobody will hear you is <laughs> is generally how I and I really enjoyed that right that's how I viewed it and um and I ended up uh, leading worship at a wedding and and uh, when everybody sang I you know I started singing the first line. And everybody sang and it was this old church building and you could just hear everybody. And it just like, I, I mean, I literally stepped back from the microphone and just let everybody sing. And it was so powerful. And so I've really grown to love that, I think. And it kind of goes back to congregational worship being a different thing than pop music or anything else. However, um, I've also been in, like I said, I've also been in those environments where I, I enjoyed the loud music because it felt like, oh, I can, I can really engage and not really worry about what's going on around me. And I think that, I think it's kind of a little bit of both. And when you start judging based on preference, I think that's when it gets, it gets to be bad news. I know uh, when I was, it was a number of years ago, but I was in a, I was in a worship band and we were, we were almost signed. Like we had a number of labels that were pursuing us. We were getting flown to Nashville and doing really awkward showcases of like us playing full sets to like 15 guys in suits and it's super awkward. That's the most awkward show you'll ever play by the way. Yeah. Um, I've been there, but you know, we did, you know, we were, so we were, we were making some noise, we were getting some attention and, but we were doing some really creative things. And, uh, and essentially what we were told is no, we're not ready for this yet. And so that's fine, whatever. But during that time I was very, very emotional and believed very much in what we were doing. It was like worship needs to go in this direction. We need to write more creative lyrics. We need to be more creative with the music. Rah, 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 rah. And I was very, uh, I actually made that noise every time I talked about <laughs> worship. <laughs> Somewhat of a it's cookie well said, monster. But... I ate cookies. Rah, 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 rah. But, um, <laughs> but here's the thing is I was very opinionated and I believed I was very right. And I and I also uh, didn't believe I was I was I, I didn't believe that I that God was against what I was doing. Okay, um, but I remember it so clearly. I was driving back to my house. I was two blocks away. I was at the corner of Jenkins and Irving. Or no, sorry, it was Jenkins and I. They were the lettered streets. Anyway, what are you talking? I was about? two blocks away from my house. Okay, <laughs> that's the bottom line. Okay. And, well, I'll be uh, there. I was kind of ranting uh, to God in the car, which is a great place to do that, by the way. And about like, you know, like we're we're working so hard, we're trying to do this, yada yada yada. And God just kind of stopped me, and just said, "Do you think people don't like? Do you think I'm not glorified when people sing Amazing Love?" And it was, I mean, I literally, I was two blocks from my house, and I pulled over to the side of the road, and I just sat in my car. And just humility just just oh. fell upon me, you know, in that moment. And and it was basically like, you know, everybody's at a different space in their journey. Everybody has different preferences. Everybody is 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 seeking God. If people are seeking God, they're seeking God. Like, period. And so whether they're seeking God to Chris Tomlin songs or to old hymns or to songs that are written in by me in my church or by somebody else in the church or a good song or a not great song. Like ultimately it's the question of, is God being glorified? And you know, when I, I may not be super comfortable in a stadium full of people, you know, belting out songs, but I also can see how that's like a glimpse of heaven and it's amazing. Yeah. And who am I to stand there and judge and say, you know, you're, you're you're wrong for you're wrong for for praising God's name in that way. Yeah, sure. So, which is kind of what he's what he's saying. But yeah. let's go to the next section. That emotionalism is not worshiping. Nope, no emotion in worship. Well, that's uh, kind of what I said earlier. Is this music is emotional? So, if, we're, if all we're doing is trying to communicate a message to our church full of already Christians, uh, then why even have a, a guitar or a piano? We might as well just read the lyrics of of songs that are theologically deep. 
Um, and that's not a bad idea, actually. And there's some <laughs> place in that. That's actually what I do on a regular basis. That's how I lead worship. <laughs> well, you're really good at it, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, why have, the, why have the music in this? Again, I feel the Lord recreated music to, to touch us, to touch, to touch our hearts. And I mean, we'll watch a movie without a soundtrack. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's not going to feel the same. It's terrible. Uh, so I, emotions and feel, uh, believe me, I know it could betray you. Emotions can betray you. Your mind can betray you. Feelings can betray you. But they're also so great. And it's such a, such a great channel for God to, to wreck you. And without worship, for me personally... I go back to Rich Mullins, like we talked about, Delirious. Yep. Uh, remember the Vineyard stuff, Brian Dirksen, oh, yeah. and incredible. God work. There's a reason, like God works through worship. He does. Man, I I, I wouldn't be here without that, and um, I'm I'm gonna have a tough time agreeing that 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 was a bad route or journey for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like we go into different spots, you know. The I think the the final point. Let me ask you this, Dan. You know, a lot of the language that he's using in this, um, it is, he, he actually puts this on point five. This is his final point. He says, it's time to boycott the worship industry because simply being a silent, dissatisfied customer won't fix anything. And wah, wah. I, you know, you know, he's like, your senses are dulled by the lack of artistry, the pervasive emotional manipulation. I mean, very, very strong words here. Yeah. But to me, at the core of what he's saying is that we're a consumer. And so the, if you're not giving us what we want, we're not going to buy. Right. I just think that's a fundamental flaw in what we are as the church. Yeah. The idea of that, that worship, I mean, you're essentially saying all these things that you're railing against, you're falling right into it at the end and saying, well, yes, the church is about, or worship is about what I want to consume and give me what I want. Give me, and it's like, no, man, it's about something so much bigger. It's about what God wants. And it's not about style and it's not about all this stuff. It's about, it's not about consuming. Right. You know, you're making it about consuming by sitting there and complaining and saying, I'm not going to spend my money on, <laughs> on what you're doing. It's like, oh my gosh, you said, will you shut up and listen to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I love that. All right, so that's the last point of of kind of the blog, and so let's just let's just conclude here, Jay. And then I want to talk about the Common Song Project. Sure. That that you, we just posted on the green room, but I th I would just like to conclude, and you, and you can give your thoughts this, after this. But I, I've been talking. Who's this here. article for? Yeah. Okay, who is this article supposed to be for? That's kind of my thought. Is again, is it just for Christians to be? better Christians or different Christians and is there a place for that number one and and I'll let you guys answer that number two um, I lost my train of thought no oh. so it who, nice so wrap it up it nice for? wrap up Dan way to go yeah thanks buddy oh I got <laughs> it I got it I come back okay is it is who's it for is it for Christians trying to be better Christians or different Christians or are we is it worship to be kingdom minded to bring people in from the outside and I, I use that term outside loosely but um, I, I sure love the idea of using music to reach the unreached and and if that takes the Chris Tomlins and these guys who I love who I think are incredibly talented and I'm not going to judge their hearts. I, I, even though I, what I've seen and talked with them, I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah, I will judge so their hearts. So what's what's I the will. article for, buddy? <laughs> you know, oh, I, honestly, I think it's I think it's for clicks. Uh, you know, honestly, but I but I think it's yeah. I think Which it's is okay. Yeah, he's well, running a business too, right? Yeah, exactly. I guess. Uh, but the thing is, I think um, I think it's misplaced frustration is what it's is what this article is really about. I think, um, you know, if you want to change something, if you want something to be different, you know, I, like I said, I've, I've, I've gone through a lot of different environments in my worship leading life in what I've done. And, um, you know, a number of years ago, I felt some of this frustration. And so I changed around what I was doing and it was, it was very, I mean, it wasn't easy to do, but I was, it was a perfect storm of where I got to change what I was doing. And I was also in the process of helping plant a church that was defining the culture of that community 
at the time, right? So I was able to, so I was able to kind of adjust what I was doing and, and lead people through it and kind of take, take people through that process. Um, I'm not going to throw stones at all the other ways there are to do things. And generally I feel like if there's a, if you want something to be different, if you're feeling conviction about something, then it's your job to go out and do something about it, not rant and rave and try and get people up in arms. It's like, go do something beautiful that people want to be a part of. Don't just throw rocks at the people that are doing their best. That's, that's to me, that's the, the, the main fault of this article. Some great points. And also, it just comes from this place that I know because I've been there and it's an ugly place. It's, it's not where you want to be. Love it. Love it, buddy. All right. I think that, I think we've kind of beat this article to, to death and hopefully death. It, it stirred up some good conversation. I, I hope I wasn't too opinionated. Jay, I hope you weren't too opinionated. We're both originally from New Jersey, so opinions are kind of our thing. <laughs> Well, we we are we love worship, and it's, I think we both take exception to people who uh, want to take it away or or boycott it, whatever. <laughs> Don't take my worship. <laughs> Don't take my worship. <laughs> so, all right. So, in conclusion, let's. I want to hear about the Common Song Project. Uh, this is Jason's child. His it's baby. my baby. My you little know. passion project. You got to go to the green room and check out the video. It's just a little short film on kind of the idea behind it and so talk about it it was interesting this article came up this week because uh it actually i've been waiting to release the project for a long time it was a project that was done uh everybody involved in it is doing things for free so from all the video editing from all the musicians everything the whole concept was like i said you know there were people that were wanting the songs and we had no way to give them to them and so what we decided to do was let's let's arrange them really well. I mean, we've got like a string section. There's accordions and banjos and mandolins and all this kind of stuff. And we just got on my friend's front porch and just filmed this video of us playing these songs. And they're raw. They're 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 not all. Uh, they're 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 very professionally done. But it's also very raw. There, we didn't do a, like a million takes, and there's not like a bunch of vocal punches, and we didn't go back and overdub stuff. And it's not like every instrument is mic'd. It's just kind of the overall feeling. But it's this idea of we wanted to say these songs are not just for the people that are leading them on Sunday. They're for everybody. So let's make them available to everybody. Let's take sacred music and bring it, bring it into common spaces. And so that's where the Common Song Project came from. It was that idea. The film is actually called Porch Songs. So if you want to check that out, uh, you can go over to worshipartistry.com or, uh, and check it in the green room, or you can also just go straight to the Common Song website, which is commonsongproject.org. It's .org because it's a nonprofit, but it's Porch Songs. I hope you like it. Um, and if you don't, like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily for everybody, but I think it will resonate with some people. And so we just, I decided to put it out there. Well, we're glad you did, buddy. I love it. I'm a fan. All right, wrap it up, bud. Thanks to Bethany for all her, her help. Thanks to everybody in the chat room. Thanks to Dan for being here. I think we're going to get Dan on here quite a bit more. Um, he's a he's a great personality to have on here. Remember, if you want to be on member mail, just go ahead and tweet at us, at Worship Artistry. Or once again, go to worshipartistry.com slash greenroom and do a search for member mail. And you can, you can leave a comment there. So once again, thanks guys for for hanging out and please don't boycott the worship industry.